Good morning, this is Casey, back with you, and uh, we've been doing, uh, the last, our last video was the Argentinian 1909 short sidearm sword, which weighed in at almost three pounds. Today, we're going to do, we're going to talk about the bow level. The 1917 United States uh, Bolo, made by Plum from St. Louis. This one here, uh, uh, this particular one was is stamped 1918, and I'll show you the the proof stamps here later on. But I'd like to back up a little bit and give you a little bit of a history on the Bolo knives and where they have uh, originated from. <clears throat> the, uh, these bolos are straight out of the, uh, the Philippines, influenced by the Philippines during the Philippine insurrection in which uh, Black Jack Pershing was assigned to quell the insurrection. And he did such a good job that he was promoted far ahead of others who had more tenure in time. So, anyway, the, the Philippines, the Bolo, that's where they come from. However, I want to give you an example of another similar weapon that uh, they kind of like interface with each other and here is a uh, an example of a uh, here's the Gurkha this is a uh, an import or a tourist model made in India and uh, you know not not much but uh, you compare the two of them, two of them, and they're uh, they're heavy at the tip of the blade for uh, chopping, slashing, Anyway, a lot of the bolos that I have seen out of the Philippines in pictures are similar to the, the Gurkha. They must have compared they must have compared notes with each other, the Filipinos and the uh, Nepalese. But uh, you know, they both lived in the jungles and, and such. Anyway, back to the uh, 1917 uh, Bolo, made by Plum, St. Louis. Uh, they were also made by Plum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And also there was another uh, different company, American Cutlery, which produced these. And I believe they were out of Chicago. There are about four predecessors that I can find to the 1917 Bolo. <clears throat> and I do not have enough to really show you, but we'll just talk about this for right now. Uh, some of these models, before Plum got involved, were made by Springfield Armory and at the cost of about four dollars per weapon. Now Plum got into the business and this is where the CT comes in from.
as commercial tolerances. Okay. Mary Sue is helping me here. Down at the bottom down here, you can barely see 1918. The year it was made. You can see how the, the hill has been brazed onto the, uh, the blade and the tag. The blade and the tag are all one piece, as well as the pommel. The plum, com com the plum company had the foresight and the forging equipment to produce these bolos at the cost of a dollar or so. Where Springfield Armory were producing them for around four dollars per copy. And the differences in the Springfield and the Plum are that on the Pommel, the Pommel is a separate piece from the tank. The Pommel was brazed onto the tank. And here comes Plum, and they forged the pommel right onto the tank, all one piece. Makes it a lot better, and cheaper to produce. And then of course they brazed the hilt onto the tank. I've got a, uh, I found down uh, an original sheath for this. It's uh, Brower Brothers, 1918. It does not have the wood insert in with, with it. Uh, this part here, this leather, you know, that's not supposed to be there. Someone's attempt to uh, stiffen this up. Without the wood insert, you don't have much of a uh, much of a sheet. You can buy reproductions of these from Sarco and other companies. Uh, I'll uh, bring them up later when I tell you the story on how where I found this. And, uh, but they do not have the sheath with the wooden insert. <clears throat> this particular one, if we could get a close up, I hope you can see this. Someone made an attempt at putting a, uh, a blood groove in here real crudely. I found this in the junk store in Laguna Legal, California. And uh, I was doing research there at the, uh, oh, the, uh, oh, the territorial repository for the Southwest. All of the old land grant records are kept there. And uh, I had a lot of free time on my hands, so I would uh, peruse the uh, jump stores. And uh, I found this rusted up, beat up, no handles. It still had the bolts and the expressions uh, on it. They were bent. You can see that 
the hilt is still kind of twisted. I don't mind about that. And it looked like it had been run over by a, uh, a half track. And it said, uh, take me home, Casey. Take me home. I know who you are. You'll give me a good home. So for $5, I got this. It hung around for years and years. And uh, I tried to find handles for it, the grips. And finally, uh, Sarko and the Firearm News, Firearms News, they had the handles for this for like five ninety five. Now this is a good, uh, this is a good company to uh, deal with. I, uh, they're my favorite vendor really, and I've gotten a lot of my education from all of their ads. They do deal with a lot of old stuff, and they usually run like a ten page ad in the firearms news. All right, love that. So, they also made the sheath uh, in 1918 out of uh, steel. And I've never seen one except in pictures. But there are so many of these original 1918 sheaths made by Brower Brothers, but they're all without the wood inserts. And the wood insert were two pieces of pine together, glued together, and then they would wrap it with wet rawhide and let it dry and tighten up. Then they slip this in here. They also had like a, uh, an aluminum or a brass uh, guide on top here. But the sheath without the wood inserts is, uh, as I would not carry it. We do carry this in the car, but we do go, go camping uh, to cut kindling and, and other little tasks. It's a good, good bow though. <clears throat> what else can I say about it? It weighs, weighs in at one point, one pound, five ounces. Where I told you that the uh, Argentinian, basically pretty much a machete, weighs in at almost three pounds. <clears throat> I'd prefer to carry this than I would uh, the Argentinian short sword. These were uh, Issued to Hospital Corps, Machine Gun, uh, crews, and uh, there were uh, quite a few of them made. Up until the 1970s, we still had these in our inventory of weapons. And I don't know where a lot of them went, you know, probably you know, I do know that Arizona Game and Fish in the 80s had these in the floorboards of their trucks with the, uh, with the wood uh, bouncing around. So it might have been an intergovernmental -gover uh, thing. But uh, up until the 70s, these were, these were still in our arsenal. Now, the Japanese in the 60s and the 70s come out with a copy of this. <clears throat> and they had their handles for uh, black Bakelite. And they sold for about $5 at uh, camping stores and other sundry stores <clears throat> and you can identify them and you can see that how they copied some of our stuff and that they 
used black bake ply for the handles. And I'll show you similarities. Here's our, uh, here's the 1942 machete. 18 inch blade. Comes in just underneath of a pound. And the Japanese bolo has the same bake light black grips. And it's got three rivets on it instead of two bolts. That makes it easily uh, identifiable as, uh, you know, one of their imports. But they copied our handles off of our machete. We're going to lay these out, so, and uh, I'll tell you, uh, this was replaced in 1942, and here is a, a 1942 machete. Let's get a close up here, and uh, we got U.S. 1942, and then across here, it says true temper. Also, here is the sheath that would have gone along with this machete. This sheath, though, is uh, Midland fabrics, but it's uh, 1944. Canvas. Flexible. You can tell the sheath has kind of shrunk a little bit throughout the years in that the machete will not go all the way in. Okay, just for the heck of it, I want to show you as far as I know what the current issue uh, machete is and what it's like. Here's an Ontario, Ontario, U.S. From what I, what I can tell, uh, that's Vietnam era, uh, on up to today. You can see the difference how they changed the handles from World War II to uh, the present. Also, we have a, a nice flexible plastic sheath. And this uh, proof marked 1989 by Stemco. You have a built-in sharpener here. I have used this, I have carried this, uh, all, all three of these items I have used. And I like, I like a flexible sheath. 
a lot better than uh, you know Tidex. Anyway, that's going to do. Uh, I think I've covered just about everything that we can on uh, you know what I know about these. You know, I I, I like this. You know, uh, I'll probably uh, one day uh, figure out a proper good sheath for it. I feel that, uh, you know, that might be a, a niche business for somebody uh, to uh, make the, the wood inserts. If I uh, knew where to buy one, I would buy one. But uh, that's it for the day. We'll lay this stuff out and uh, get a good close-up for you. And uh, our next video will uh, probably be on a, a tool that we just acquired. So, <clears throat> we'll lay this out the best we can for you so you can read uh, everything on it. That'll be it for the